Hi, I am Sharon Rackham King. I'm an artist here in Corvallis, and I'm so excited that you are joining us for Arts Alive 2020. I loved being part of Arts Alive 2018 and 2019, and it's when I discovered my joy for live painting. Today, we're going to be working in watercolor. We're going to be working on a panel. And so we'll create a poppy that's along the lines of this. And it's not watercolor paper we'll be using, although the same techniques apply. This is actually a little piece of cabinetry. It's a panel. And I'm very excited to share this method with you, a water media panel. Well, let's introduce this kit to you. You will find a cradled panel, and this is made by American Easel in Salem. It's called cradled because this edge stands out from the panel on the top. There are different surfaces that this comes in, and the surface that we'll be using is water media, which means it accepts water and paint much like a watercolor piece of paper does. However, you can hold this. There, there are a lot of advantages that you'll be seeing to this, and you'll be able to see how it spreads the paint on the surface as well. So when you open this, you will want to uh, think about two things. One is, if you want to protect the table or surface where you're working very easily, you can just lay this plastic right down, put your panel on top of it, and paint. The other thing that would be good for you to do is to wipe the surface of it with a clean cloth. Well, I'm not using a very clean cloth in my example, but I know that it is a cloth that will not spread paint on to it. The other thing that you'll want to do is you'll have your panel and you can wipe the surface of it just to make sure there's no dust from the construction. And you can use a clean paper towel or a lint-free cloth to do that. Now, moving forward with other pieces of your kit, you know, I should say, I should say, your panel is four inches by six inches. The panel that I will be painting on is eight inches by 12 inches. So those are the same dimensions, the same type of drawing would have the same ratio. So your brush, I am so pleased to be able to present to you using professional artist materials. This brush, and when you take off the clear plastic cover, you'll want to just hang on to it because that is great if you're transporting it or you're storing it to keep the bristles protected. So this is a size six, which is a medium size brush, but it comes to a very nice point. It holds a good amount of water. So those are some of the characteristics that you could be looking for in a brush. The painting order that we will be using starts with clear water. That allows the paint to spread using a wet into wet technique. Then we'll go with yellow because that is the lightest color. And as you know, blue would be the most staining color for anybody out there eating blueberries. You know blue is the most staining. So we'll go from lightest to darkest. Red is there in the middle. I will be using this brush some of the time, but if I'm doing a large wash, because I have a larger panel than you do, I will also grab one of my larger brushes to cover some areas quickly. So let's start out with some areas that, well, I am seeing that I didn't clean my brush appropriately and a little bit of red is escaping from the brush into this water. That happens sometimes. A, a note about your brush. When you're not using it, it's proper to take it outside of the water. These palettes have little 
raised dots on them, which make a good place to hold your brush. Leaving your brush in the water can damage the bristles and can make it so that that fine point will get smashed and the bristles can splay out. So when not using your brush, I would take it out of the water. Oh, we use, another note, we use water that is room temperature, certainly not hot, because that can interrupt the the adhesion of the bristles into the ferrule of the brush. So this is almost clear water. It has just a tinge of red in it. And I will start with the stem. So I'm going to do, I didn't do two lines for the stem. I just did one. The poppy is such a beautiful, delicate flower the stems, it, it does not seem possible for such a fine, thin stem to be able to hold up the head of the poppy, and yet somehow it happens. So I get some yellow on my brush, and I'm just going to go over where I have already painted in the clear water. Here's another stem. I could also, for a stem, just lay the yellow in directly. What we're going to do, because we have primary colors, and you, you can mix them in your palette. I did mix some blue and red here to get purple. However, um, in, in interest of conserving your materials, it's really a fun technique, I think, and, and a way to conserve by blending your paints, mixing them into secondary colors and beyond on the surface itself. So we have some, a pool of water here. You'll want to, one way to know if you have enough water is to look at it from the side and to see the sheen. So we'll just lay a little bit of the yellow down into that water and see that it spreads out. If you want to go all the way to the edges, I invite you to do that. Since I have a decent amount of yellow on my brush, I'm just going to dip it into the water without allowing it to, um, to spread the paint to spread into my water because it doesn't do me any good there in the water. For this first petal shape, I am leaving, I've got a, a very faint line here. It's almost like an upper lip and a lower lip. And so I am going to not put yellow paint down into the lower lip, if you will, area, because I would like for that to end up having a, a shadowy feel. And I like the achievement of that being between red and blue. I'm gonna come in over here and try to just add primarily some water. Your water, if you wish to change it out and have absolutely clear water, feel free to do so. Uh, you know, it's we're not going for absolutely pure colors in this particular painting experience, so it's it's really up to you. And again, I am leaving a lot of this lower area just empty for the time being. I do think I will switch to that larger brush now. Your brush will be able to cover this area just fine. So this is a big, thirsty, wet brush. In this area, I am going to leave a, a slice of pie, um, a party hat size kind of shape. And 
in this area because I want for that nice darkness of the center of the poppy, at least the poppy I'm thinking of, there are so many different varieties. That's one of the reasons that I thought a poppy would be good for this exercise is because when you're perhaps learning something new, some of you, I suspect, are trying this for the first time or don't have tons of experience with watercolor, then it's, it's nice to have something that is somewhat recognizable. And one of the ways that poppies are recognizable is that, that very, very thin stem and that they have usually an orange or red color with often a dark center. So I'm looking from the side to see what I have covered and what I haven't. And I'm going to add in yellow. And I'm going to, and you can see how it just really spreads out with the water. I'm not going to paint it entirely um, covered with yellow. And I'm going to work with one section at a time, skipping around. And that's so that I'll have a little bit more natural coverage and a little bit of a break from one petal fold into the next. I do think it would be a good idea to get the yellow up towards the very top because that is where the sunlight is going to catch it. And so you'll see the richest yellow colors toward the top or outer edges of any of these petals and petal folds. And I'll draw them down toward the center, but I'm not going to interrupt into that, um, that piece of pie in this area right here. So I'm going to move into red now because clear water is the lightest, then yellow, then red, then blue. I needed to re-wet some of these yellow areas, which you can do with a brush that doesn't have color on it because I wanted to continue this wet into wet experience. You certainly can paint Oh, I love it. I love it. That's called a bloom or a blossom or a spider. Could be like a spidering out. So I don't want to be exact. I don't want to cover all of the yellow. And, um, oh, you know, one thing I should mention is that I'm painting flat. You can choose to paint flat or you can um, have it at an angle. And, you know, sometimes just as simple as a paper towel roll underneath one end or the other gives you the dimension that, that, that some folks want for that. And I see that it's spidered outside of the line. Well, you know what? I have all sorts of tips and tricks for that. So I'm just going to go in the same order that I did originally. I don't need to cover this red all the way up to the very top edge because like I mentioned, the sunlight will give that yellow hint where it should be, which would be from the top, of course. And um, just let that red work itself around into the yellow paint and the water. So I mentioned, oh, you know, that certainly went out of the line. You know, it's, you may have lines that show in Sharpie or in pencil, you may not. And then I think it's really cool when things like this happen and they, they, water is attracted to water. So when you have a wet brush with paint on it, that paint wants to flow just like rivers flow into oceans. It is the same principle they want to flow to each other and they will, which is one of the reasons watercolor is so intriguing, beautiful, fantastic, enchanting, and frustrating. 
<laughs> it's all of the above, which is one of the reasons why um, artists love it so much. People often say, oh, you're a watercolor artist. I, I can't do watercolor. I mean, that's just so hard. I can paint in oil. And I think uh, you're my hero if you can paint in oil. I, I can't even begin. And um, I think it has that watercolor can have that reputation of being challenging because you don't necessarily know what is going to happen. It, it often dries a bit lighter than it goes on. Although I will say with these panels, they keep the paint a lot more on the surface. So you get a, a very good vibrancy from it. And it's, a, and it's a good shade of white. There's a lot of different watercolor papers that come in different shades and none of them are particularly white. So if that's important to you or you want a plain background that's white as we're going to continue using in this example, then a, a panel might be for you or look for a watercolor paper that has a certain brightness to it. So one area that I didn't do, and it's good to come back in, I would like this area to have a bit of a purple feel to it. And so um, I'll leave the orangey mix up here. And then by adding this in, this has had just a bit of a chance to dry. And so we'll get not quite orange stripe, purple stripe, but along those, along those lines, they, it won't all bleed into each other. You can see my water's a little bit peach colored here because we've been using yellow, we've been using red, and time to dip into the blue. And when you dip into the blue, you don't need much. So I would dip carefully. Um, depending on if you're right-handed or left-handed, one thing that you will find is your sides of your hands will get paint on them <laughs> almost inevitably. I want to go to the lowest edge here. And so that's something to check for, and that's another good reason to have a paper towel handy. Now, when you pick up a strong color, any color, but it's most noticeable with a strong color, the, the first couple of brush strokes that you make are going to be the strongest. Now that I've exhausted much of the blue out of my brush, and we did take a little break, and so you'll see a change in how this is drying. You'll see that this is more of a purple color than the brighter blue that it was earlier. This was the first brush stroke that I made, and so it is holding more of that intense blue and less of the purple. But I like how it has spidered into or bloomed or blossomed into the more red orange area of the petal. So since I have exhausted much of the blue, I'm going to think that this is a good opportunity to add the blue that is left onto the stem. I am choosing, however, it looks like it's turning a bit purple. So you know what? I'm going to get most of the water off of my brush by touching it to the paper towel. I'm going to get just the, the little end of the brush wet, and I'm just going to get a tiny bit of blue paint and see if we can get more of a green. Okay, I'm already seeing a little bit more of a green effect. I'm choosing to paint this stem first only because I won't have to reach over a wet stem to do it next. So that's one of the thought processes that I use when uh, trying to decide painting. You know what? I got quite a bit of blue, didn't I? Well, I can always Touch it to the paper towel, dab a little bit of it off. 
I can try to lift. You know, your brush doesn't only apply the paint, it lifts the paint. It works really well for both applications. And we don't want the stem to be totally consistent in color because that's not how nature works. And especially when light is hitting it in different areas, some areas will be more blue, some areas will be more yellow, some areas will even have a little bit of that red flare to it. If we only had green in the stem and we didn't have green in the body of the flower, it wouldn't look quite as natural. And if we didn't have any of this little hint of red in the stem here that characterizes the rest of the flower, then, then that wouldn't look as natural. And I'm not, let's see, I'm using my side of my hand and small finger as an anchor because that helps me know where I am going. That helps me guide. Where I'm heading next is to add just a, a brush stroke of water here and then I want to get a little bit of a blue shadow in here. Oh, that spiders nicely. You know, I might just leave it like that because um, because it's kind of it's kind of cool. Yeah, we'll 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 be uh, keeping an eye on that and see how far it spreads. This next step, I'm going to um, drench this this white area here, the remaining white area, in essentially clear water. And then I'm going to go straight for blue. A lot of times the center of a poppy looks as if it is black. Black in watercolor. Oh, look at that spread. This is, this makes my day. Um, black in watercolor doesn't often look particularly natural. And so um, I, I choose I choose blue in this circumstance. I actually like it a bit better when these areas have a bit, these other petals have a bit of inherent wetness left. Mine have had the opportunity to dry, but it's nice when it kind of naturally feathers in. So I'm just going to take my brush and kind of, you know, do an up and down little jagged kind of stroke to get it over here. You get a little bit of a green effect from that blue because there is enough yellow in this area that it um, is mixing with the blue to create some of that green from our color wheel lesson. We remember that. I want to get some of the blue up into the yellow and red as well. And again, I'll do what kind of that little jagged step with my brush where I'm just touching up and down, up and down. Those are, that's a, that's a pretty good rich blue. I'm going to add a little more where it is pale. I'm going to let this dry a little bit and then I'm going to go back in. But in the meanwhile, I think something that will help make it look more natural. So there's the, the stamen and the pistil, and I believe that it's lots and lots of little stamens. So I have a dry brush, I'm really dipping the tip into this blue paint, because what I want to do is do some small-ish dots in random locations various sizes and various orientations. So sometimes I'm going to hold my brush kind of to the side. Sometimes I'll hold it the other direction. And it often groups of three uh, things tend to look natural or odd numbers of objects tend to look natural. But I just want to give it that 
feeling that that we have some of the stamen that are um, against this beautiful red orange background that we have here. So in addition to having the stamen be on this petal, oftentimes they're going to extend themselves. They're going to be jumping out. And something that you may notice is, well, when I took botany, I would think that I remember that those are actually attached. <laughs> they're not just loose and on their own. So you could do a couple little lines but I'm not attaching it to it. I don't really want them to look like lollipops. I just want them to, to have a sense. And I'm not going to attach every one with a stem, um, just a few of them so we get some of the naturalness. Because I still have some good blue on this brush, I want to highlight a couple of these lines that, that will be showing that there is a fold in the petal. Oftentimes you're gonna do that on the same side each time. And what you're seeing here is that the brush is skipping the paint over the texture. And so if I were to get the brush more wet, then it will create more of a line. But if I want to just do that skipping, I could uh, con continue on with that dry brush effect. So just getting a, you know, touching a couple areas, hitting them with a little bit more definition, I like to do, but not every single one in the same um, position. You know, we're, we're going for repetition with variation, which is one of the principles of composition that we try to keep in mind along with 17 or 35 other things while we're painting. And uh, hopefully I've been able to share some of those with you today that can help stay in your mind and make some of your painting experiences enjoyable and successful. So one of the other characteristics of a poppy that makes it look like a poppy is that the stems are quite fuzzy. So what I'm doing here is taking yellow and going along each side and that repetition with variation uh, the variation is that I'm doing some on the left, some on the right, trying to get some close to each other, some farther spread apart. And uh, so having done that with the yellow, then I can uh, go back in in just a moment and do that with the blue on top of it. I'm going to be judicial with the blue because the yellow just gives this nice little halo to it. Um, it doesn't need to be all the way green. Again, part of the thought process of choosing the poppy is so that um, we'll get something something recognizable. Uh, you know, I probably should have should have not dipped my yellow brush into my little blue palette, but I'll scoop up the yellow that I left, get a little bit of blue and uh, touch here and there so that some of the fuzzy areas show up a, a bit more as green versus yellow. I'll just, you know, this where the paint clings to the plastic on the side is a really good opportunity to pick up just a smidge of, of the paint and especially with that potent blue color, sometimes that is handy to be able to only get a very moderate amount of it. We're going to move back into the poppy in just a moment here because we took a little break to let this blue dry. Hopefully you will have the opportunity to do the same so that this area is dry enough 
What I like to do is then add some red areas in here. Um, I don't mind purple. Purple is absolutely one of my most favorite colors. However, in this application, I don't want spread out areas of purple that are like this right in here. This is not perhaps the most realistic version of a poppy. It is a fun, happy version of a flower. Um, if you want to do botanical illustration, it is oh, such a gorgeous, you know, style of art. And um, I do, I do see the place for that. This one just has a little more personality than um, something that is meant to be scientifically representative. And where you have something, some characteristic color, shape, in one area, it's good to see to add it into other areas as well. For example, we want a little bit of the mixing of the blue and the yellow to get some kind of green in the body of the poppy so that you know that the stem um, has, has a partner here and it isn't just on its own. For that reason, I'm gonna add it just little sporadic intervals some red into the stem. And if that red is too strong and it's not blending in, which it's not because you have dry paint, it's gonna sit on top, especially on these American Easel watercolor, the water media panels. Then what you do is you just get your brush a little bit wet and you just gently blend it. One of the things I should say about watercolor is that it does take a light, touch if you're doing work that is small. Um, your panel's pretty small because, because that is the way that, that um, most of us start. When you decide that you really are enjoying this and you want to invest and get um, another panel, for example, if you get a larger one, you may find that it is easier to paint on a larger panel. I'm adding a little yellow into this blue. We're gonna get a little hint of green, which is exactly what I'm going for. I am so appreciative of your interest in the arts and your willingness to go on a little watercolor journey with me today. I would love to see how your art looks. Please, anything that you are creating, share on social media. You can use hashtag ArtsAlive20, and then we will get to look at each other's artwork and sharing it together. When I teach, I always say thank you for the art, and I would love to say that to you today. Thank you so much for joining me.